Welcome to Zoom at Times TV, and here's your host, Anita Finley. Good morning, everybody. We are now doing another Zoom at Times. Um, well, we, we call it Zoomer Times because our name is Boomer Times. It's a Zoomer Times TV presentation. We have a lot of them and a lot of people are reading them, listening to them rather. And and uh, we, we love our authors. There he is. So should we start over now? I guess we will. Okay. I want to introduce our wonderful guest today and it's Peggy Gaines and Peggy wrote our book of the month, uh, and, and we, she wrote it actually for um, May, and I'll show you, this is the cover of the magazine where she, we focused, featured her, but this is the cover of her book, and I have it in front of me. Um, I'm Anita Finley, as I said before, if you didn't get it, and I'm so pleased to introduce our very guests. Some are authors, some are scientists, some are entertainers. And I enjoy this so much because I get to hear people, but I know you get to hear people. How many of you walk down the street, you have no idea who you're looking at or talking to? Little do you know how famous many of them are, how kind and uh, how so much they have to talk to you about. So I feel privileged and especially my guest today, Peggy Gaines. Peggy had a um, a very, well, it was a terrible trauma in her life with her son. And that's what the book's about. It's called Three Quarters Full, Blessings from a New Perspective. And I'm going to let Peggy kind of talk about why she wrote a book called Three Quarters Full. And, and it is what the actual story is about. And then I'm going to ask her to read one of her chapters. It's a very, very compelling book. Sometimes I get these big, thick books and I don't remember them after a few months, but Peggy's I will always remember. So go ahead, Peggy, tell us why it's called Three Quarters Full. Well, thank you. Uh, it's so nice to be here and I appreciate your, uh, the fact that you enjoy the book and that you found um, some, you know, some inspiration from it. Uh, it was a, um, a situation where uh, as a mother, you find uh, your child is facing a, a very big life crisis. And as any parent, we want to help someone that we love through a difficult time. And the thing about this is that I learned so much from my son. He was someone who was ready to go into his senior year in high school. He um, you know, everything, he was smart, he was funny, he was kind, he was doing well in school, everything was going his way. And suddenly we find out he has a brain tumor and life, it's like the bottom drops out. And everything that you thought was important, suddenly, you know, it, it's irrelevant. And so not only for me and for my family did it the bottom drop out, but for him, it definitely was. He suddenly, he couldn't go to school because he had to have two brain surgeries. He had to have chemo and radiation. He was very debilit. It was very debilitating. And so the things that were important in a young teenager's life, your friends, your girlfriend, working out, you know, physical fitness, all this kind of stuff, suddenly that was taken from him. And what I learned from him is that we can either look at a situation as a victim or we can look at something with a new perspective. And that's what I saw. Uh, I saw a new perspective. And so we go into the doctor's office, into the oncologist's office, and here was this big, tall guy who was 6'4". He had been very physically fit. He had beautiful, thick hair. You know, he liked to exercise and work out. And he, you know, had a girlfriend and lots of other friends that he hung out with. And suddenly he can't do that. And he goes in and he's transformed. 
His body is now just skin and bones. He can't go to school. He can't, you know, hang out with his friends. His girlfriends left him and he walks with a limp. And he but walks now, wasn't him. this, it was over a year, Peggy. This happened when you first found out. So it, you, you're yeah. talking about over a year, aren't you? Probably about, about nine months or so after that. Oh, after too. you birth. had hope, didn't you? Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. You just lived with hope. You made the decision this, you know, there are always miracles. You expected a miracle, you know, at, at, you know, a certain percentage aren't going to make it, but there's some people that do, you know, so we were going to be the ones that did. And so we walk into the doctor's office, the oncologist office, and here he is, you know, his life has completely changed. He can't do anything that he normally could do. And the doctor says, Nathan, how are you today? Is the glass half full or half empty? And he answers without missing a beat. He said, it's three quarters full. Oh and I was just amazed yeah. because he didn't have to even think about it. And I didn't even know that was a box you could check. You know, I just thought it was one or the other. Yes. And most of us would have said, I think it's half empty. You know, so much had been taken away from him. And yet he could see not what he had lost, but what he had. And he still had his friends. He had his family. He had, you know, he was looking at what he had. And he still had the, you know, the belief that he was, he was going to make it. As tough sure. as this was, he was going to do it. And so I, I thought... You know, I, I told him, you know, I'm really proud of you because I don't think most adults would have seen things that way. Yeah. So he was helping me every, so many times along the way of letting me see this is a new perspective. This is his life that it's impacting more than anybody. And yet he has this amazing perspective. So I, you know, started really, you know, as a mom, you pay attention and you listen and you remember. And um, so that is where this book came from, are things that I learned on that journey with him. And, and uh, we, I didn't introduce the fact that you are a meditation specialist. And that gave, it's, it's very, you know, it's fine for you to be as positive as you, as you can, but it does take, of course, a terrible toll on a parent who loves a child and sees this. And you told in the book, meditation was a saving grace for you. It, it really was. Um, I, you know, I had started meditating because I was having trouble sleeping. But I really feel that this, this was a journey that started even before he was born. You know, I feel that um, the divine that source, that God, whatever term you'd like to use, was guiding me along the way. And that this was just the step that I had the trouble sleeping and learned how to meditate. So I had a tool that would help me through this. It wasn't just coincidence. It was part of the plan. And, and did he meditate also? Did you teach him that yes. too? Yes, I taught him how to meditate and he, it helped him a lot. It helped him to stay calm and to deal with, you know, I think that probably helped his perspective quite a bit because meditation, you know, I am a nurse. And so I, I studied meditation after this was over with because I thought I knew it, it helped me. And I learned the science behind it. And your brain literally changes when you meditate. So now if someone mm -hmm. wants to meditate and they, of course, there are a lot of YouTubes and they can get on or they can do it in a, a room filled with other people mm -hmm. who are meditating. Um, how do you think they should start though? Should they just go as a novice and, and it'll be easy? Or was there something you can say to them? Yeah, I, I think you have to... Uh, first of all, I think guided meditations are great for relaxation. But if you want your brain to change, 
There's no science that shows that the guided meditations change your brain. There is science that shows that mindfulness style of meditation actually changes the amygdala, the part of the brain that handles stress. There's measurable change within six weeks. With even less time, there is there are other changes in other parts of the brain. But meditation affects the prefrontal cortex, which is your executive function, uh, your decision making. It 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 improves your creativity. It helps your sleeping. Uh, it helps you deal with stress. So anything you use your brain for is impacted by meditation. But it's the meditation where you're going. You're finding that stillness. Now, you are never gonna stop your thoughts. You are never gonna blank out your mind. People come and say, well, I can't, I can't meditate, I've got too many thoughts. Well, so does everybody. So I, I, we talk about that and we talk about that's okay to have thoughts, but what we're doing is we're, we're helping our brain to focus so that we are not just going here and there. We're focusing and you go into this place of stillness and it may be just for a moment, but that makes a change. I, I tell people to give them a, a, an example of how it works. When I was in high school, I worked as a dental assistant. And so one of the jobs that I did, the dentist would take the x-rays and I would go into the dark room and I would put them in the developer and the fixer. And it was really a closet. And if somebody didn't realize it was in there and opened the door just for a moment, just went, oh, sorry, light came in and would make a slash of, you know, an imprint on those x-rays. Same thing happens when you're meditating. You may have thought, 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 thought. But when you're, the way that I teach it is you're focusing on your breath and you're focusing on a mantra. So you still have thoughts, but instead of thought, 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 there's thought, 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 thoughts. You're still having thoughts. What we're doing is going to this space in between the thoughts. Mm -hmm. It may be just a millisecond of time, the same amount of time that you opened the door and closed it. But that's all you need for the light to come in, for metaphorically speaking. Yes. That's that moment of time of quiet, just a moment. That's all you need. And it begins to change the synapses of your brain. Let I'm me tell sorry. everyone, my wonderful guest is the author of Three Quarters Full, Blessings from a New Perspective. And uh, we're going to have her read something. But if, if um, someone wants you to get in touch with you, to have you help them with meditation, I guess you do this over Zoom. How, how will they get you? They can look at my website at PeggyGaines.com. Okay, PeggyGaines, G-A-I-N-E-S.com. So for you, those of you who would like to have a real expert, someone with a big heart um, and who's been through so much herself, maybe let's take the time. I want you to read something from your book. It's chapter seven, and you can read the little quote from Aristotle, and then you can read this. It's very poignant. So anybody wants to get their Kleenex out, they can, but please do it. Okay. So the quote that begins chapter seven is by Aristotle Onassis. It is during our darkest moments that we must focus to see the light. Mm -hmm. Although the doctor had predicted Nathan would die in 10 days, we were fortunate enough to have him for 12 weeks. Each day was a blessing. Every morning, the nurse from hospice would come to bathe Nathan. We would then lift him into the wheelchair and take him out onto the patio next to the pool. Mike, his dad, would fix him breakfast, his favorite meal. Mike would whip up different Jewish specialties, lox, eggs and onion, matzo brai, or cheese blintzes. While the two men enjoyed breakfast together and talked about the mysteries of life, I would either go for a bike ride or to a yoga class. Our days were filled with talking and listening to music. My brothers and sisters had sent gifts trying to lift his, Nathan's spirits, including recordings of classic comedies. Nathan didn't really want to watch anything. He preferred to talk about what to expect when he crossed over. Mm -hmm. 
some of his questions were so innocent and some so funny that they made me smile. He asked, how will I know where to go? You just follow the light, I replied. There will be a bright light and it will show you the way. It will be like the stars the explorers used to follow as they crossed the ocean before compasses were invented. Just follow the light, I instructed. Granddad will be there also. You'll feel his hand squeeze your shoulder. My dad had died a few years earlier. My dad had a trademark greeting when he walked into a room. He'd reach up and squeeze your shoulder to say hello. I'll finally get to meet Eric, Nathan exclaimed. I had lost a baby at five months gestation when Nathan was a toddler. We kept the memory of Eric alive as a way to talk about death with the kids. I had had the miscarriage shortly before Christmas one year, so a friend had given me a Christmas ornament that looked like a baby angel. Every year as we decorated the Christmas tree, we'd talk about Eric, how old he'd be that year. We'd imagine what he'd look like. By keeping his memory alive, the kids understood that they already knew someone in heaven. Nathan had always liked having a girlfriend. His high school girlfriend had broken up with him when he was diagnosed with cancer. My heart ached for him when this happened, but I understood that this was a big weight for this girlfriend to handle at this age. Still, he missed having the companionship and affection that only a girlfriend could offer. During one of our late night talks, Nathan asked me, are there any girls my age in heaven? <laughs> the question made me smile. Oh of course, I replied. Remember Helen Witte? She was a girl about two years ahead of Nathan at school. Everyone knew Helen. She was the, one of the shining stars, top of her class and very involved in school. She'd been rollerblading on a on a sidewalk and was hit and killed by another high school student who was under the influence of drugs and alcohol. The community was horrified at her death and her memory lived on. Helen will be there and she'll introduce you to all her friends, I reassured Nathan. So the lesson from this one is when your child trusts you enough to ask a question, Listen and answer to the best of your ability. Don't shy away from any issue or minimize the importance of their concern. I real, realized I could be more resilient than I ever imagined and answer questions I never anticipated. So that, you know, that was it. amazing. It was an amazing thing that you did and the way you carried on and wow I just it's so poignant for me I mean especially having you, you read it my goodness and was it easy to write it really was it kind of came to me over really just a few days I mean it's a very short book but it just it uh, it took me a while to do it I didn't think I could write and then I just got this feeling I, you're supposed to write this book. Right. And so that I, I just felt that the words kind of just, I was just holding the pen and the words came through. Of know. course, it's a very important book. Are you now thinking of writing another book? Maybe not about him, but now that you're experienced, you maybe it's on meditation because you do have a flair. There's something about the way you talk, the way you might want to think about that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I tell you, I just think there are so many things that we can learn that, I mean, I love teaching. That's my big thing. I love teaching and I love empowering people. So, you know, I think I mentioned it needed that now the meditation, the focus that I'm doing with the meditation is um, brain health, that to, there are so many people that are predicted to get Alzheimer's. Yes. And it's, I feel like it's a, a national, I mean, it's a world health crisis, honestly. They, uh, you know, I, 
know over the course of time, a lot of women who've had breast cancer, haven't you? Yes. Haven't you known a lot of women? Yes. Yes. And statistically speaking, they say one out of 11 women will get breast cancer. Well, when you look at that perspective, one out of six women will get Alzheimer's. And that is uh, just mind blowing to me. And the thing is, we don't have to be, we can take control. We, there are lifestyle things that we can choose to do. And there's a meditation that they have found, a style of meditation that they have found that it activates your brain. And really, they found that it really has a big impact to keeping your brain healthy and um, helping to prevent Alzheimer's. It's, it's all this information comes from the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. So I, yeah, I've started teaching those classes. And even people that are afraid that they say, well, you know, my mother had it or my sister had it, or, you know, it doesn't mean you have to have it. No, that's even right. If, even if you have the gene, it does mm -hmm. not have to be flipped on. Right. You, there are things that you can do to keep your brain healthy. And yes. so we know that now with heart, heart conditions and all that, that yes, yes it, you have to be more careful because if it's in there, but you're right. If you do all the things that we now have learned, it will certainly uh, lower the, the, yeah. Um, yeah. the chance. But yeah. I'm glad that you, so now what we're doing, you're doing the meditation, but you're doing it focusing on that area of the brain, unless someone just wants playing meditation, but exactly. if they want the other, you are prepared. Are you one of the only people doing something like this? There, I don't know that there's anybody else in Miami who's doing it. There are, there's, you know, this is a foundation and since you're on Zoom, you know, you can do it. it don't, you don't have to be in the same city, but there aren't very many. I'm certified through this organization. And, uh, you know, I just feel that, it's, I just feel that it's something we need to get on top of. This is- what, what do you call it exactly? What kind of meditation should someone refer to it as? It's, it's called Kirtan Kriya, which that is a Sanskrit word and it means moving meditation. So what it, what it, the way it works is that it's a chanting meditation and you are using all many different senses. You are visualizing, you're using tactile, and you are doing auditory. And they have found, so the DNA, I think everybody's familiar with what DNA looks like. It's just kind of a, a coil. At the end of the DNA, there are little caps and they are protection for the, for the DNA. They're called telomeres. As yes. we age, you're familiar with that term. Yes, I am. And they get shorter. Exactly. All right. So regular meditation, the type that, I, you know, for stress reduction and the mindfulness style, from what I have read, it increases the telomere repair by about five to eight percent, which I thought that was great. Yes. Then I learned through the Alzheimer's Foundation that this other style of meditation increases the enzyme that repairs it by 43%. Oh, Peggy. 43%, I know, I know. So Peggy, can someone do this? Let's say they wanna do it just one time with you. Do you have a certain series? How do you work this? I, there are, according to the, the, uh, the Alzheimer's Prevention Foundation, there are four pillars to help you prevent the occurrence of Alzheimer's or cognitive decline. So it's really, you know, and even if you don't get Alzheimer's, just that the senior moments, we don't have to accept that as normal aging. It's just like, if we, it's, um, this is like a muscle that if we're working it, if we're using it, we, we can, we are creating new brain cells. It isn't that you know, it used to be, we thought that we are just, our brain just kind of got older, but we are creating new brain cells every day. Well, we know now about plasticity of the brain yes. and, and that's, but that's not what you're talking about. I mean, new brain cells, but not what you're talking about specifically. 
Right. But it's, it, it, but it's, uh, that's what I'm talking about is like neurogenesis where it's creating new cells, but the, this all it's, it, all of the uh, research shows that your brain actually changes within like four weeks or wow. no, they say eight weeks, eight weeks is what they say of doing this. And it's 12 minutes a day. So it's not that long. Uh, and it, and so I, I talk about that. We could do just one session, but the other sessions, stress is a big um, cause of, of uh, cognitive decline because stress produces cortisol and that's a neurotoxic. So it's toxic to your brain. So when you, if you have just a little stress now and a little stress later, that is fine. But we tend to live in a hyper aware, we're always, what's that sound? What's going on? I've got to remember this. Can't forget that. This is the way we live. And so when we live in this heightened uh, awareness, we have stress, 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 cortisol, 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 and it, we, be, we become acclimated to it, but our body isn't. So we start having the way that we know we're having stress, we start having more frequent headaches. We uh, may have tight muscles. We may have, uh, 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 you know, we may grind our teeth at night. We may have trouble sleeping. We may stress eat. We may have a short fuse. Uh, you know, we may forget things, things as you were saying. Yes, and we start <laughs> forgetting things. And it's because of all this stress. So this this class gives you, it's an empowering class. It gives you the information that is, a lot of it is new. Yes, if you've been eating a healthy diet, you're on track. But there are some things in this class that you may not know in this one session about that. I also teach different stress reduction techniques in addition to the meditation. And this is based on Chinese medicine. Uh, and it's like, you know, different acupressure points that will help you to relax when you, when you. So my guess, I mean, this is going, you know, it's off the book in a way, but this is why I believe she was able to write this, this well-written, lovely memorial really to her son, Nathan, this three quarters full. And it's um, blessings from a new perspective and it's Peggy Gaines and, and Peggy, again, you said that they can look you up under PeggyGaines.com? Yes. And I suggest that, uh, you know, I would like to actually, I'm thinking about what we could do in Boomer Times with this, because I think people, I don't think they've ever heard about this. This is, it's not the telomeres, it's what you're saying about avoiding, you know, avoiding Alzheimer's. And this is coming from the National Alzheimer's Association, yeah. which is pretty good. And you saw where someone just said, that they think they have a minor cure for Alzheimer's and now it's being highly contested and yes. lots of things, but at least it's something out there. Yeah, yeah. there's, uh, because so many people are gonna be affected, there are, there, there is a big emphasis to try, you know, a lot of research to try and find a cure, but most physicians, you know, will say that the brain is so complicated that, one pill just isn't going to do it. Uh, yeah. So there, but so we need to empower ourselves and do what we can to keep ourselves healthy because we are living longer, and we want our brain health to be as long as our physical health. Yeah, I mean everything you said is just so wonderful, and and the book is. If you've lost anyone, whether it's a, a child or a husband or somebody, I think this book will help you. It will, you know, as, as much as it's sad, there are some very happy moments and smiles and just some of the things that you read. And the fact that you, that, that he was so optimistic. And I attribute that to you and your husband. I don't think kids, as they say, the, the, you know, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> And I'm sure that that was your life even way before. And the thing we didn't say at the end was that he wanted to have his ashes 
why don't you tell that and tell them what happened? I think we have a little time left. Well, he wanted, um, I asked him, as we talked about everything because, um, you know, I think it's scarier when you don't talk about things. When, you know, and sometimes people will say, I don't want, I don't want to talk about it because it upsets the other person. Yeah, and yet, right. if you don't, you know, if he wanted to talk about something, I wanted to be there for him. I wanted to let him know that, you know, he, you can handle this. It's, you know, and we're going to talk about it. And he wanted to be as informed as he could be about all this. Thing. And so uh, I think, I, I, I think it also really illustrated to me the importance of that we shouldn't wait to talk about these issues, mm -hmm. such as, you know, talking about uh, what would you like to do to remember you? You know, I asked him, do you have, you have, what kind of celebration would you like to have? Yeah. Uh, and, well. and, and he told me all, it was so funny. He told me, because I, as I read, breakfast was his favorite meal. And so he wanted to have a big breakfast and but he wanted to make sure that you know all his friends came so when we were he, i said you know he wanted to know how will i know how my friends know that i have died and i oh, said well you know i'm gonna call a couple of your friends they'll call the others and then there'll be a, an obituary and and they'll see that and anybody that comes to the funeral Amazing. will be invited to this reception Amazing. and so he said well, in the obituary, could you put in bold letters, free breakfast? Then I know. Oh, my you know, Poppy, that, that's it. That's it. And we're running out of time. But I know that he loved a place you visited and you went there again. Yeah. To, and where was that again? Oh, it was in Glacier National Park. And it was at Iceberg Lake. It was the place where God lives. It is so beautiful. Oh. So I'm not sure, but we ought to think about that. How are you advertising it now, anyway? Um, my book, I'm really, uh, I am not. Um, it's on my website. So it's okay. on my website. That's yeah. Well, maybe it's, yeah, it's something to think about because it, that's very uh, special. Well, Peggy, I am so happy to have had you on again. I mean, I this little book, uh, it should get lost in my other books, but it doesn't. It's kind of like Thank a big you. thing. Thank you. A friend of ours took the pictures and uh, he is so, such a wonderful photographer. Yeah. And yeah, so I love the picture. It was beautiful. It was yeah. really beautiful. So Dan, are you there? Yes, I am. What happened to Dan? Because uh, I don't know, he, he's usually always there and he's the one that told me we had no, no time left. So anyway, we can keep talking. If it shuts down, you'll know I'm not, oh, there he is. Wasn't that beautiful, Dan? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So what did well, we- Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. It's very sweet of you to give me two times. It's very oh, nice. no, but that was